Okay, we were discussing the skeletal muscles. The first lecture you have received, you have uh, we have discussed the structure of the skeletal muscle, and then the classification of the skeletal muscles on the basis of fascicular arrangement or on the basis of arrangement of the fibers are also called as architectural arrangement this is one classification now we discuss what is the nerve and blood supply of the skeletal muscle well the skeletal muscle you know it has to do a very powerful function for example to move the whole body and to lift the body weight and used in running, jumping and playing. That's why it's natural that the skeletal muscles must have a good blood supply and a good nerve supply. And in addition, we perform some very fine movements, very fine functions with the help of the skeletal muscle. And for this reason also, the nerve supply should be very good Okay, now look, before going to the blood and nerve supply, look at the muscle. I told you that the muscle is being made up of muscle fibers, the red fibers that you can see. These red fibers that you can see, these are muscle fibers. Now, and many muscle fibers get together to form one muscle bundle or fasciculus and many fasciculi get together to form one muscle and each muscle is you know being included in a connective tissue membrane which we call it as epimysium now present inside the muscle there are somewhat one dozen or six to 14 number muscle fibers are present specialized muscle fibers present inside the ordinary muscle fibers somewhat 6 to 14 are number are one dozen in number and being surrounded by a thin connective tissue capsule these specialized muscle fibers being surrounded by connective tissue capsule, this is called as muscle spindle. In the same way, there is also present one spindle in the tendon. Now, these small fibers present and surrounded by capsule, these these muscle spindle fibers these are also called as intrafusal that is being surrounded by the fusiform capsule and the other muscle fibers which are used for contraction of the muscle they are also called as extrafusal these muscle fibers are extrafusal these are intrafusal now note the point that the extrafusal muscle fiber that is ordinary muscle fibers they are used for contraction and produce movements but these muscle fibers which are present in the spindle or inside the capsule are intrafusal fibers these muscle fibers are also being supplied by sensory and motor both fibers but mainly this muscle spindle and tender spindle it acts as a sensory receptor and it transmits the information to the central nervous system about the state of contraction of the muscle. That's why, because of this reason, now I'm sitting like this and without thinking, without thinking, all of my body parts are in a normal condition it never becomes abnormal abnormally open your mouth or abnormally hang your neck because each fraction of a second 
your mind knows about the state of contraction of the muscles being transmitted by these spindle fibers and this is what we call as proprioception pro prio p r o p i r i o proprioception is the state of contraction of the muscle which in which the muscle remains and this is always and each fraction of second being transmitted to the central nervous system through the sensory nerves which are being supplying the muscle spindle and the tendon spindle one is this that this that's why all the time your posture remains normal even without thinking secondly now for example you are doing stretching exercise stretching of the body now without thinking again the stretching always remains up to the extent that it would not tear the ligaments stretching up to the extent which do not tear the ligaments because the muscle tendon spindle gives the information the stretching up to such extent is sufficient more than that will damage this is the function of the muscle spindle and the tendon spindle and these are muscle fibers but they are specialized and they act as a sensory receptor okay now come to the nerve and blood supply this is one muscle a quote in a the epimysium usually usually the nerve this is the nerve and this is the artery and along with vein and maybe lymphatic all these enter into the muscle usually on its deep surface not at the upper surface because when the muscle contracts and relaxes then it is safe that this nerves and arteries will not be tear that so enters in the deep surface at a point this part which is called as motor point this point through which the nerves and arteries and lymphatics enters into the muscles usually in a deep surface this point is called as motor point this point is called as motor point now the nerve which supplies the skeletal muscle is usually said to be that it is motor nerve but it is not only motor but it consists of each each nerve that enters into the skeletal muscle it consists of motor fibers then then sensory fibers and then sympathetic fibers in this way the nerves that supply the skeletal muscles of this limbs this limb and this body part this neck muscles are the face muscles this skeletal muscles the voluntary muscles that are being supplied by nerves these are mixed nerves having three types of fibers motor sensory and sympathetic the motor fibers which are supplying the skeletal muscles they are either coming from the spinal cord or coming from the brain they are being cut they are coming from the brain cranial nerves and coming from the spinal cord they are called as spinal nerves now the motor fibers which supply the skeletal muscles they are of two types alpha type of motor fibers and gamma type motor fibers the alpha type motor fibers which are supplying the skeletal muscles these muscles these are coming these are coming from the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord look look if you draw a cross section of the spinal cord this is look let this we say the anterior horn this one and this one is the posterior horn the anterior horn cells these are motor cells and the posterior horn cells these are sensory cells while the cells in the lateral horn over here only present in the thoracic region and the upper to lumbar region these are sympathetic in function in this way the motor cells the fibers which are coming from this anterior horn cell of the spinal cord they are afferent in nature and those supplies and these these 
alpha fibers, this supplies this ordinary or extra fusel muscle fibers. While the gamma fibers, these are small fibers, this supplies, this supplies, this intrafusal or spindle fibers. These are also motor. The spindle have both sensory and motor supply. Okay. Now the sensory supply which comes in this nerve, it is the motor supply, the, the fibers, motor fibers are 60%. While the sensory supply, it is 40%. These sensory supplies, these muscles which enters into the muscle, it divides and these muscle, these nerve fibers now supplies these ordinary muscle fibers as well. But for what? For general sensation of pain, touch and temperature and to stimulate. And secondly, these the, 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 the sensory fibers, the motor fibers are coming at enters into the muscles, divide into branches, are of two types, gamma and alpha, and each motor nerve then ends over here at the muscle fibers at a small plate which is called as motor and plate. And this motor motor fibers then stimulate the muscle fibers for contraction while the gamma motor fibers it also enters the muscles but they do not supply the ordinary muscle fibers but it supplies the spindle fibers or intrafusal fibers and these stimulate and they regulate the function of the other extrafusal fibers how much to contract and how much not to contract while the sensory fibers that enters into the muscle, into the muscle, it also divides into branches, supplies the skeletal muscle fibers, but only for general sensation of pain, touch, and temperature. And then the other sensory fibers, it supplies the muscle spindle, and the muscle spindle that is specially supplied by the sensory fibers, it transmits the sense of proprioception, which means that the sense of contraction of the muscle that how much contraction muscle is at this time and how much should it do so that it does not stretch more than that to tear the muscle that is called as proprioception and then the third type of and then the third type of the fibers nerve fibers which are coming in the, the nerve these are sympathetic in nature and these sympathetic fibers that are coming from the later heart cells of the spinal cord of the thoracic and first two lumbar region. This enters into the skeletal muscle, but note it do not supply the skeletal muscle, neither it supply the spindle fibers, it only supplies the blood vessels, the blood vessels present inside the skeletal muscles, and it supplies the smooth muscles of the blood vessels so that during time the blood vessels when, when needs to be increased for example due size they dilate the blood vessel and when no blood is needed they constrict the blood vessels this is the action of sympathetic fibers they do not function they do not supply the muscle fibers but they supply the smooth muscle fibers of the blood vessels being present in these skeletal muscles okay then 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 it is said yes okay i just would that the spindle fibers the spindle fibers which are present inside the capsule and intrafusal fibers of the muscle spindle, it is of two types, nuclear bake fibers and nuclear chain fibers. And the sensory nerve endings and the sensory nerve endings are again of two types. Number one, the uh, the, the, the uh, enormous spinal are okay and flower spray of two types of sensory nerve endings. Okay, this is just you understand, but the main is this description. 
Now look one point that each muscle fiber, each muscle fiber, each muscle fiber, let me say these are muscle fibers. Each muscle fiber is being supplied by a motor nerve and as well as by sensory nerve. Let me say motor nerve and sensory nerve, each one supplies. Now, you know, the cell in the anterior horn of the spinal cord, one motor neuron present in the anterior horn of the spinal cord, from which one nerve comes, one nerve fiber come out from one neuron. And now it supplies many muscle fibers. One neuron, motor neuron in the anterior horn of the spinal cord and the number of muscle fibers, skeletal muscle fibers that it supplies, it is being combinedly called as motor unit. Motor unit is the motor neuron in the anterior horn cells and the number of motor fiber that it supplies. Now, how many muscle fibers are being supplied by one neuron? It depends upon the type of action. Now, for example, a very fine, fine movement is being needed. For example, in the extra occular muscles of the eyeball in which you do eye movement is very fine or you are doing some very fine movements in the, at the hand fingers. In these areas, where very fine movements are being needed, the number of muscle fibers being supplied by one neuron is less. While in other big, big muscle fibers of the trunk, of the buttocks, etc., where the fine function is not needed, but only more power is needed in that big, big muscles, the number of fibers being supplied by one motor neuron would be much more than in those in which the fine function is being needed. Okay, this is about the motor unit. Now what happens, I told you that each muscle fiber is being supplied by motor and sensory fibers. What happens that one fiber, one stimulated, one nerve comes into these muscle fibers and it is stimulated, stimulatory effect comes the muscle fiber stimulates by all or none law. That is, either it stimulates fully or it do not stimulate at all. So if one muscle fiber is being stimulated, they stimulate fully. And if not stimulated, that it remains fully relaxed. Then what is the advantage of this thing that Allah has given to us? Now let me say, this is one muscle having many muscle fibers. Now what happens that at one time, at one time, one group of muscle fibers, for example, these four or five muscle fibers, they are fully stimulated, the other remains relaxed. At another time, the middle group of fibers are being stimulated and these one and these one get re remains relaxed. At another time, this group of muscle fiber is being stimulated and the other relaxed. What does it mean? That number one, if all the muscles are not being stimulated all the time because the skeletal muscle get fatigued, that's why the muscle would not get fatigued because all the muscles do not stimulate at one time. Okay, now this type of contraction in which one group of muscle remain contracted, stimulated, fully and the other groups remains relaxed this is this type of contraction occurs in a resting state or in a posture now look i am just sitting i am not moving any part except the uh, the mouth cavity the, the oral cavity for you people otherwise if i am sitting just look my neck remains erect it do not fall like this but it remains erect for hours and hours and the muscle do not get fatigued for the reason that at this time 
I am not producing any movement of the neck, but I only, I only keep the position or posture of my neck in a way that the muscles which are involved in keeping the posture of the neck, those muscles, each muscle is just partially stimulated because half of its muscles or one third of its muscle fibers are being stimulated and the rest remains relaxed and the muscle as a whole remains in a partial state of contraction and this partial state of contraction of the muscle is being called as muscle tone. Muscle tone is nothing but it is the state of partial contraction of the muscle and this is specially necessary to maintain the posture and to maintain the posture the muscle do not get fatigued for the same reason that in muscle tone the muscle remains partially contracted because some of its fibers are contracted the rest are relaxed and the muscle at a whole is partially contracted then these muscle fibers are stimulated the other contract and in this way the body posture is being kept all the time because of the tone of the muscle and the tone of the muscle is the partially contracted state of the muscle. And partially contracted state of the muscle means that some of the fibers are stimulated, which are fully stimulated. The rest all remains relaxed. And the muscle remains the whole partially stimulated. I hope this will understand what is muscle tone and why it is necessary to maintain the posture. Okay. But now when muscle action is needed, when now muscle action is needed to produce any function, then what happens that, that if this is the muscle, that now all the fibers of the muscle are being stimulated and all the fibers of the muscle now stimulate, contract. You know, I tell you that, that the one characteristic of the muscle, the special characteristic of contractility, it contracts in shortening length and after shortening in length, it produced the desired movement. The muscle can produce the desired movement only when it contracts and get shortened in length. For example, you can see this biceps muscle, this one, this one. And over here, you see this bicep, bicep muscle over here, this one, look, this bicep muscle, this one. One end is attached over here and one is attached over here, you can see one attached and one over here. Now when this muscles contract and get shorter in length, it brings this forearmer like this and produce the flexion of the elbow. Along when one another muscle which lies deep to it, that is brachialis. So biceps and brachialis combinedly contract, shorten in length and produce the movement, the desired movement which I have desired and this muscle, this muscle or the group of muscle which produce the desired effect that is being called as prime mover. For example, when flexion of the elbow is being needed, then the biceps and the brachialis is or the prime mover because biceps is one of the member of the group. So if only one muscle is being responsible for any desired movement, then that is the prime mover. Or three, four, five muscles are being needed for the, to reach the desired movement, then all these four, five muscles are the prime movers because at that time your mind has decided to produce one movement and that movement is being produced by a group of muscles or by one muscle, that is all, that all is the, 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 the prime mover muscles. And such type of contraction in which in which the muscle, the muscle shorten in length, okay, that produce the proper movement and such movement and such movement, okay, that is, this is so, this is necessary for the muscle to produce any movement, it should contract and shorten in length, okay. Then, and this type of movement is being called as prime mover. OK, 
Okay. Second group of muscles, one is primover. Second group is called as antagonist. Antagonist is that muscle or group of muscles which antagonize the prime mover. Now note the point. Now at the flexion for the flexion of the elbow, this biceps muscle, this one, this is the prime mover. Well, the triceps muscle which lies over here, which lies over his triceps, this extend. That's why we say the biceps is the prime mover and the triceps is the antagonist. But note the point, if the antagonist do not allow the prime mover to produce the flexion, then it would not be able to, to produce the desired movement. Now what happens? Allah has arranged like that that when a stimulatory impulse comes to the prime mover, at the same time inhibitory impulse goes to the antagonist so that the antagonist is relaxed and the prime mover is being stimulated. So this antagonist now remains relaxed and allows the prime mover to produce the proper or desired action. That's why it is said that the antagonist is muscle, a group of muscles that antagonize the prime mover, but at the during the action of the prime mover, the inhibitory impulse goes to the antagonist, and the antagonist at that time remains relaxed. Okay, the third type of movement which is being produced by the muscles that is the fixators. Fixators. Fixators are muscles, are group of muscles. Look, look. If I want, look, okay, if I want to withdraw the camera from that man, then I myself should be stabilized at my own position. If I am not stabilized, then if I want to withdraw that, then if he applies the force, then he would withdraw me. The desired moment they will not be produced. That's why some muscles are like that that their origin or their proximal end must be stabilized by other group of muscles so that it can act the, the desiredly at the, at the distal end. Now let me say, look the deltoid muscle, this deltoid. Deltoid is being attached to the scapula. Now the deltoid actually want, look, to do the abduction at this end, to lift the limb up. But its origin which is to the scapula, if that is not being stabilized and the deltoid contract and then if the scapula come downward, then the deltoid would not be able to lift the limb up. At this time, the desired action is to take the limb to the abductor position. And this is possible, it is distal end. But if the proximal end of the muscle or the origin of the muscle is not stabilized, then if contracts, the scapula will come forward and then the muscle would not be able. That's why if at the back, over here, a group of muscle that are attached to the scapula like this. Look. This is the scapula. Over here, there is a group of muscles that withdraw the scapula backward and allow the deltoid, which is attached over here, and allow the deltoid to act at the distal end properly. They only keep this bone to fix in position and to allow the deltoid to act properly at the distal end. So the fixators, fixators are a group of muscles that stabilize the origin or the proximal end of the muscle so that to allow the muscle to act properly at a distal end or at its insertion to produce the desired effects. And those group of muscles which are only used to stabilize the origin, that is their group of muscle or that one muscle that is being called as fixator. And now the next group of muscle, next group, the next group is being called as synergist. Look, 
understand the difference between the synergist and fixators. Now look. Look at these long muscles coming from here, crossing the elbow, then crossing the wrist, and then reaching to the fingers. Okay? Such long muscles, such long muscles coming from the humerus originating, crossing the elbow, then crossing the wrist, and then reaching to the fingers. Now, let me say at this time the desired action is to flex the fingers to make a fist. Okay, now what you do at this time, you do it practically as well, you flex the wrist. And now you make now you try to make the fist. Your fist is not so powerful. You can't flex the fingers properly to make a proper fist. So it is must that if the desired action is at these distal joints, these proximal joints are must be stabilized. Now the muscle when passes over here, when if you don't stabilize this joint, then the unwanted effect would be produced at the proximal joint, and this unwanted effect, for example, deflection, is, is, is produced at the wrist joint, then you can't flex the fingers properly. So what happens? Some muscles are present over here, only attached over here. For example, flexor curve pyridialis, and some muscle attached over here on the dorsal side. That is extensor curve pyridialis, elongation brius. What do they do? This flexor curve pyridialis and extensor curve pyridialis elongation brius, they contract, they contract, they do not produce movement, but they only contract up to the extent that they stabilize the proximal joint so that to allow the long muscles to act properly at the distal joint to flex it so this group of muscles will stabilize the proximal joint okay and these are you, you can see look this is one flexor capillary dialis and this is the extension of these two antagonist muscles but this antagonist group of muscles they stabilize the proximal joint the wrist joint and allow the finger to flex proximal and distal joint such muscles are being called as synergist so by definition, synergist is a muscle or a group of muscle that stabilize the proximal joint while the fixator stabilize the origin of the muscles. And this synergist stabilize the proximal joint to, to prevent the unwanted effect at the proximal joint. If the unwanted effect is produced, the effective movement in the distal joint would be reduced and the desired action would not be so proper. This group of muscles are being called as synergist. Then one another way of acting of muscle is being called Alright, so if a muscle is stimulated by motor nerve and it contracts and it contracts up to the extent that it shortens in length and it produces any movement, such type of contraction of the muscle in which the muscle length is shortened, that is called as isotonic contraction. And at sometimes, at sometimes, at sometimes, a contraction of the muscle would be needed in which the muscle would remain contracted but it would not shorten in length and it will not produce any action. <coughs> Such type of contraction of muscle is called an isometric contraction. For example, I just keep a weight over here in my limb. Now, these muscles are being contracted but up to the action that it do not produce any movement, but it only keep my limb in this position, which is carrying weight. So the muscles are contracted. There is tension in the muscles, but up to the action that it do not produce any movement, such contraction is also called as the, the, the isometric contraction. What is another type of a third? 
in which the muscle remains contracted and slowly increasing in length and <clears throat> such contraction in which the muscle remains contracted and increasing in length slowly such contraction is being called as eccentric contraction and this eccentric contraction is needed where now let me give you the example i take a glass of water look from the table then i did this supination then i did the flexion at the elbow now the bicep is the prime mover and the tricep is being relaxed the antagonism less and i bring it over here and i take the water from over here now i want to put the glass back now what happens now when i want to put the glass back my brain desired like that now the biceps will be inhibited and it will be relaxed and the tricep will be stimulated this will antagonize now it would extend the elbow and bring the glass and my hand like this but when it reaches at this point now my hand and glass both comes under the effect of the gravity and you know gravity even think it attracts toward itself at this very time the biceps again contract this is being desired by the brain the biceps again contract but it contracts so up to the extent that it slowly increases in length acting against the gravity the gravity is taking the glass and my hand toward the table but the biceps the tricep now release relaxed and the bicep now remains contracted remains contracted but slowly increasing in length and now acting against the gravity so that to allow my hand to put the glass comfortably on the table and this type of contraction in which the muscle remains contracted but slowly increasing in length and acting against the gravity this is eccentric contraction and the action is called as action of paradox so if i don't do this bicep do not contract then what will happen under the effect of gravity my hand will fall along with the glass and will hit the table and will break the glass in this way this is the functional classification of the muscles that is the prime mover the antagonist the fixators the synergist and the action of paradox and the contraction of the muscle is again of three types isotonic isometric and eccentric okay i think this session for today thank you very much